Eu sou daqui mesmo. Minha família mora há mais de 100 anos, num lugar só. Meu bisavô foi morar lá, meu pai nasceu, eu nasci, agora minha filha nasceu. Tudo daqui da Trindade. O pessoal plantava aqui e fazia farinha lá na vila. Ah, vamos fazer a casa de farinha aí. Então vamos fazer a casa de farinha. Porque a gente descia até lá na vila com mandioca. Está construindo uma casa tradicional mesmo. Então a gente não está comprando madeira em lugar nenhum. É né? tudo madeira do mato. A casa vai ser de, de, de barro. Então ali tem é, jacatirão. Tem uma cajarana que caiu, que a gente aproveitou para fazer é, os esteios. Tem o louro, né, para fazer o assoalho. Use it for the, the uh, rafters. We have several different pieces of wood to do the joints and the mud and wattle, and the sticks for the mud and wattle. It's all trees that have been felled from the forest right around us. We're doing everything collectively. We uh, leveled the ground and we felled the trees and we're going to have a, a roof raising here, a, like a barn raising. And the, when we finalize the mud and wattle walls, I have a party at the end. Everybody gets into the fun building the mud and water walls like adobes. When you have a manioc flour mill, the other families come. It's a place where people meet to grate the manioc and then toast the manioc flour. It's a way that we join together. We work and it's like a party and many hands I make like work. That's the best part of it. For a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. They can't understand. We're living in the forest. We're working on our crops and fields, you feel like you're part of the nature's cycle, alive, really alive. You're right there on the land, growing banana, manioc, fruit trees. It's also a way of resisting the destruction that's encroaching on the land. People living traditionally today are conserving nature, they're conserving the planet. People today that only depend on industrialization, this unbridled commerce, felling trees, selling everything, they're favoring deforestation, they're favoring planting with pesticides and monoculture and chemical fertilizers. When you work and live like this, you have the possibility of planting and reaping in harmony with nature. This relationship that I have with planting and harvesting, this harmony with nature, people are losing out on this, but not us. Who's going to eat uh, a stew made out of uh, green bananas? Ministério do Turismo. The Ministry of Tourism and the Casa Azul Association introduce and present the 19th FLIP, the Parachi International Literary Festival. The project benefits from a federal law for cultural incentives and the Vani Cultural Institute with official sponsorship by Itaú Bank and the Vani Cultural Institute. The festival is organized by Casa Azul Association, the Special Secretariat for Culture under the Ministry of Tourism and the Brazilian federal government. 
Nyirijira. It's a Guarani word that means means the Atlantic rainforest. It's where the spirits bathe. Migrant botanies. These are Guarani indigenous children singing in the background. Vegetalize, transforest, act one. Listen to the green in search of truth, metamorphosis, cartographies to postpone the end of the world. This roundtable is live and broadcast in three channels by on the internet, the original audio, Portuguese, and in English. Please choose your language that, uh, that you prefer. You can address questions to the authors through the chat box on YouTube. At the end of the interview, some of the questions will be addressed to the authors. And we wish you all a wonderful flip. Good evening, one and all attending. Welcome, one and all, to the 19th edition of FLIP, the Parachi International Literary Festival. This year, it's totally online because of the health measures, the necessary health measures. We're going to have an important roundtable with two great writers, Alice Walker and Conceição Evaristo, and I'm Jamila Ribeiro, a writer myself, and it's a huge pleasure to chair this roundtable. I'm going to introduce the two great authors. Alice Walker is a writer with vast production. And Alice Walker has published numerous books, but I'd like to cite The, the Color Purple and this book that she's launching here in Flip, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which is published by Bazar do, Bazar do Tempo here in Brazil. Welcome, Alice Walker. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you here to FLIP this evening. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I want to, sorry. We are truly happy to have with us and introduce Conceição Evaidista, who's this great Brazilian writer who was born in 1946 he has a master's in Brazilian literature from the Catholic University and competitive literature from the Fluminense Federal University. She was a writer with vast production. And now she organizes Carolina Maria de Jesus, the child of darkness. She, Conceição de Evaristo Poncia Vivencio has won the Jabuti Award, uh, the Becos da Memoria, Annies of Memory, the uh, rebellious tears of black women. It's a huge pleasure to have Conceição with us again here at FLIP. Good evening to you, Conceição Evaristo. Conceição's microphone is turned off. I think your microphone is turned off, Conceição. You need to unmute your microphone. There we go. Good evening, one and all. It's a huge joy again to be here at FLIP, uh, giving me this joy and an intense joy to meet Alice Walker remotely in this interview. It's a great opportunity for us to join together. My sister, she says in English. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful, Conceição. Okay, I'd like to take the freedom to greet the Orisha from Candomblé. It's her day today and Candomblé, which is a religion, which has this search for our ancestors. The two of you as authors, both Alice Walker and Conceição Evaristo also include this in your books and feature it. So I'd like to address the first question to Alice Walker, talking about the importance of us addressing our ancestors, bringing them into our literature, this search to value the place of black women and <clears throat> this ancestral uh, women. What is the question? Why is it important? 
Well, uh, we can't really go anywhere without them uh, because if we, if we tried that, we'd instantly be lost um, because in all of our cultures, our, our, our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers um, have stood as strongly as human beings could stand, I think, on the enormous pressure over many, many years and centuries actually. And we need that strength. We need to know that it is possible to continue standing in our own truth and our own beliefs. Conceição para você. Conceição for you. You also do this exercise based on what you writing experience in one word. Everything that you write is marked by your place as a black Brazilian woman. What's the importance of having this view as a black Brazilian woman? Without a shadow of a doubt, I think that what the talk and speech that permeates and coming before our writing is precisely that of our ancestors. Without a shadow of a doubt, I think that we talk, it's as if our ancestors gave us this possibility of speaking. They, speaking without the, uh, our elders, the voice, the primordial voice of our, the mothers, our, our mothers and grandmothers and voices, which oftentimes in, in most cases were uh, uh, fulfilled in silence. So I think that our writing is exactly this. We take the silence of the voices of our ancestors, the women that came before us, and they, we turn this silence into shouts. Taking advantage of what you just said, Conceição, and picking up on what you said in the interviews concerning this round table, you brought the issue of similarities of encounters with Alice Walker's writing. And you would also like to make these comments to her about the similarities between the two authors' works. Okay, correct. That is true. Reading Alice Walker's writing, and I was recalling as well when the first contact that I had with Alice Walker was through the film, uh, The Color Purple. That was many years ago that I remember that my daughter was still a very young child still at the time. And when I saw The Color Purple and what I feel is draws us close to Alice's writing is exactly this. It's to seek in the voices of the older women, the basis for our speech. I could not fail to say also that in 2006, the published Professor Aparecida de Salgueiro's dissertation was published in the first PhD dissertation, PhD dissertation, which does a reading in dialogue with Alice Walker's writing and my own writing. So it's a huge pleasure because of that, because of that PhD dissertation. And when In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, the speech, the art of those women, which oftentimes they didn't have the opportunity to, to explain all their power and make it but they look for paths to express their art. I wrote when I say that the basis, the foundation is exactly the voices of enslaved women in the big house. So these are the women who through the enslaved voices, but these are the women who, despite a situation of enslavement and a situation in which they did not choose, it was imposed on them. So these are the women who empower our voices. These are the women who are present in our, in our literature. So to perceive this in Alice Walker's 
writing and also that our path as a black writer, it's also a path which is very similar to hers. I believe that this proves this power or this uh, similitude and brotherhood and, and sisterhood between the peoples of the diaspora. And here I've stated also that black writers, the black women writers in Brazil, they're writing, we find more a way of dialoguing with African-American women and with women from the Caribbean and Cuban women and African women than the writing produced by other authors, women authors in, in Brazil itself. Our writing have a closer dialogue with foreign black women writers than white Brazilian women writers. Perfect, Conceição, that's fantastic. And the question for Alice Walker, could you talk a little bit about your, to Africa and the Middle East, your, travel, your travels there and the bridges that you found in your visits, especially with regard to the women that you uh, uh, tell about in the books? Okay, but thank you, Conceição. I, I love what you say and I feel, um, sad that I don't know more Portuguese um, so that I can, you know, study um, the work of African-American, African uh, Portuguese people. I, I know it's a great loss, um, but it is one that I try to remedy as best I can. Um, so the question was, I'm sorry, Jamila. Uh, about your travels to the Middle East and Africa. Okay. And the, you, you could talk about these bridges and the similarities that you found there in the Middle East and Africa. Well, I've traveled to Africa since I was a teenager, actually. Um, and I went because my roommate in college was from Uganda. And she was just the most beautiful, wonderful person. And of course, we had only heard negative things about Africa. And then there was this incredible woman who was just fantastic. And so I had to go to Uganda to find out how she became that way. And from there to Kenya and you know, years later to other parts of Africa, I worked um, to attempt to eradicate female genital mutilation, which made it possible for me to travel to many, many places because it's, it's a terrible thing that's there. Uh, and in the Middle East, of course, my interest is in Gaza and the uh, necessary liberation of that part of the world which is, in my opinion, suffering under Nazi rule. I, I consider what has happened with them a Holocaust. Um, so <clears throat> I have been there a couple of times. I tried to get there once by boat, um, but was turned back. Um, but I feel very strongly about that part of the world and the treatment of women not so much the treatment of women in Palestine because there's more equality. In their case, it's the Israeli occupation that's, that's the horror. But in many other cultures, the situation of women has been you know, dire. Uh, and what is so challenging now is the you know, apparent uh, disintegration of the planet so the people are homeless and they are forced out of you know wherever they live and and they're just roaming the the planet so that is a very great concern for all of us now we have this concern could you also talk a little bit about this meeting that you had with indigenous teachers in the amazon that you had an interview with them, the Conseil. So, since you, in a sense, you have a connection 
to Brazil yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Oh yes, well, <clears throat> I consider plant medicines, the ancient plant medicines, crucial to opening uh, a part of the, especially the American psyche that has been so shut that our entire history as Americans is often denied as if it just doesn't exist. I mean, there are people who wonder why black people even protest anything. I mean, they, they can't believe that slavery wasn't beneficial. <laughs> I, know, I know this is very challenging to even imagine. Um, but I went to, to um, the Amazon uh, and before that, I went uh, to have medicine, you know, with people in circles in, in California, because I wanted to understand not only what people are saying to each other, I wanted to understand what nature was saying to all of us. And so it was profound, and I am very grateful. Conceição, dear, reacting to the answer by Alice Walker. We in Brazil also have this search for Africa. Uh, Africa, we're always in dialogue in the sense of talking about African Brazilian literature. This place uh, for us of this search that you do in your writing, it's also a place. Is that also a place of redefinition uh, and healing? Uh, Jamila, I have said that our quest, is my microphone open? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I have always said that our search for, for the meaning of our Africanness, a Brazilian Africanness, and to what extent this meaning and significance it exists, and to what extent this meaning of this Africanness, Brazilian Africanness, to which, to what extent is it important for us? I've said that this meaning, this Brazilian Africanness, this Brazilian Africanness, it is a foundation. It's foundational for us as Brazilians. In general, the Brazilian nationality is profoundly marked by Africa, and in the case of Black Brazilians, Africa, in a sense, it is a, also a place which places us, or it is a place of search, which leaves us, makes us more comfortable inside Brazil to affirm our African legacy and heritage in all senses of the word you were talking about. Uh, herbs, and we know also how for African cultures and uh, the, this memory also, and this relationship to the land, how it is also, and it was and is important, and how it guaranteed as well the survival. When we had nothing, we have the experience that if you have nothing to eat, if you plant, and my home, sweet potatoes, manioc, replaced bread. So this relationship to the earth and this relationship to plants and with herbs, I spent my early childhood drinking teas from our garden. Rarely did we go to the doctor. We had tea for everything, teas. and. Today, I it's still I don't like to take uh, medicine from the drugstore or like allopathic drugs. So I think that our African heritage, this memory of our African heritage and this ancestrality, this desire for an Africa that we don't know, for an Africa that is transformed into a fiction and also feeds our own fiction. I think that this also creates a place of comfort for us. It creates a basis and steadfastness in situations which are not often comfortable. I think that the history of black people in the diaspora 
It can be in the United States, it can be in Cuba, black people can be anywhere in the Caribbean, they can be in Brazil, but the history of black people is always a, a story which is marked by exclusion. So if to grasp an origin, even if it's fictionalized to a certain extent, this sustains us, yeah. this gives us vigor to take a stance and position ourselves. For both writers, both you, Conceição, and Alice Walker are writers who take political stances. I remember a quote by Conceição where you say that for black women, it doesn't suffice to write. The difficulty is to publish. How do you view today the scenario in the editorial market for black women writers. Jamila, it's improved a lot. And going back to the case of Afro-American women writers, I remember that in the 1980s, when we met here in Rio de Janeiro, there was a collective of black writers called Negricia, and especially we women, it's funny that this was a major concern of the women writers. It was that we felt a very small number of women writers, at least in the 1980s, you can count them on the fingers of one hand. There was no writer that was published in a large publishing house. The first one was connected to us, Jenny Guimarães from Sao Paulo. And we looked at the United States and we already we knew about there were more black women writers. So our desire was for one day that we would have this in Brazil. And now we have a pleiad of writers who are there. They've been published. But now it was a, a hard won struggle. We did, this was not given to us. We won it by our insistence our steadfastness, demanding without being invited and marking our presence. So today we have made huge conquests and strides, but it's something that we uh, searched out for and fought for. Mm -hmm. Alice Walker, could you react to this answer by Conceição? Talking a little bit to us about the editorial market of publishing market of black women writers in the United States. Tell us a little bit about this struggle for more black women writers to be published in the United States. Okay. After I published The Color Purple, and after it was really attacked, especially the movie, uh, and my personhood was actually just, you know, if people could have gotten a hold of me, I don't know what they would have done with me. Um, but, I realized that rather than struggle and fight with these people who didn't understand my gift, I would start my own publishing company. So I founded my own publishing company and published other people, uh, all, of them, all of them women, I think, except maybe one, one, one Balinese painter, but everybody else, women of color, uh, and I see that as part of what Black women do with our particular brand of steadfastness, which is to say, no matter what people are doing about you, saying about you, how much they are condemning your voice, how they wish you would shut up, your job as a Black woman is to remember why you are here on this planet. There's a reason why you're here. It's because you're wonderful. You like the planet. The planet has no problem with us. The planet loves us. We should really understand that. So then it's our responsibility to bloom the same way that the planet does. You know, so we, our bloom is our creations. We make things. We, you know, we dance and we sing and we, you know, make clothing and we do our hair and we, you know, we are earthlings. Black women are definitely an Indian. Uh, I have to say, I'm, my other ancestry is indigenous Indian here, Cherokee. But we all make things and we love to do this. 
So the response to you know any kind of controversy about whether we're published, whether we're not published, should be, can we publish ourselves? And we can. I mean, it's a lot of work and I really got very tired and I certainly got tired of reading all the manuscripts because you have to. Um, but, you know, younger eyes and, and, and more energy, you know, there can be collective ownership of publishing companies. I had one, I, I know that's possible. It can be a mail order business, you know. Uh, you can go around to everywhere and reach your books. It's the same way you, everybody sells everything. You can put it on the internet. So, so actually part of what is happening is a flowering of the work of black women. But it's also true that without you know, the, the outside uh, affirmation, we, have, we affirm ourselves from within. You know, this is steadfastness. This is what the ancestors, the grandmothers, the mothers, you know, they looked at us, you know, our little nappy headed children over there and, and saw our brightness and our sweetness and our high intelligence. And they, you know, they wanted us to go out into the world and do the things they were not permitted to do. And most of us have done that, which is just a wonderful thing. And we should just stop everything periodically and celebrate that. It's beautiful. It is in dialogue with, uh, with the initiatives to begin to write in black uh, notebooks, what the black notebooks. That has a lot to do with the black writer's notebooks here. I have said the Colombo group, which is this group of black writers from Sao Paulo, men and women called Quilombo, where it's self-financed. Quilombo this year is, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it's the 44th, I think it's the 44th uh, section or anthology, a publication, an anthology that's published every year. One year it's prose and the, uh, it's poetry. Every other year, prose, poetry. It's the story of Brazilian literature. There's no publication as that has persisted that long mm -hmm. as this publication. Mm -hmm. Quilomboji, and it's a publication that's maintained by the desire and efforts and the struggle and this black savings. And at the same time, the Maza publishing house that's been in the market 30 years, it also emerged to publish black writers in Belo Horizonte. There's a Nanjala, which is by a uh, managed by blacks, Maneco in Rio de Janeiro as well. Uh, organized by and managed by Blacks and other publishing houses, smaller ones that have begun. Sometimes we call them, we call them like garage or backyard publishing houses that sometimes we've managed to launch our writings and get them out on the streets and into people's hands. When Alice was talking about that we go, we walk and against the current and you know Jamila quite well. People, I was recently thinking about the saying, the saying is an African saying, the dogs bark and the caravan passes, right? So that's it. I think that we should not waste time listening to the dogs barking. I love it. The dogs bark and the caravan, the caravan passes, passes, so oh, we persist. Ah, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Conceição ficou sem som, né? Conceição, no? I was speechless for a minute. Okay, <laughs> I just stopped speaking. I stopped. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead, go that. ahead. I, I'm going to use that phrase. Uh, you, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to, to just say the dogs bark and the caravan passes. <laughs> the caravan passes. This saying, I'm pretty sure it's an African saying. <laughs> 
It probably I'm not is. sure exactly I where it, it comes from. It's so true. Oh my God, it's so wonderful. Mm. And we know quite well what that means in Brazil, right, Jamila? Oh, yeah, and how, right? We know exactly what that means in Brazil, right? All too well. That's amazing. Alice Walker in the book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which is published here. It's a beautiful edition, by the way. Thank you. You bring, you talk about the civil rights movements, Martin Luther King, Coretta King. What's the importance for these new, younger generations of what can they learn from the story of the civil rights movement in the United States? Oh, that our struggle is endless. Uh, as long as we are in the United States, we are here to stay and so is our struggle. Uh, and lucky for us, we have wonderful people to inspire us. I mean, at every level, at every time, you know, since we got here, we have wonderful people. And Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Coretta, were great people. Yeah, uh, I, I should just sing out her uh, name a little more because people don't realize uh, how committed she was to world peace how she was a singer. I don't know if people realize that, that, but she was a singer. So she traveled the world singing. Um, she helped to raise the money that I needed as a student to go abroad my, after my first year of college, because she understood the importance of, of black young women having an international perspective. Um, and I met him briefly because, you know, he was, he went to the school across the street from where I went to school for a while. So we are just, you know, it, we, it's, it's just great for people to understand. And there's a great new book called The Three Mothers. And one of the mothers in the book is Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother, uh, uh, Bernice, I think her name is. Anyway, uh, it's very uh, important that we recognize how he was raised and what he took from being raised by this particular black woman, a really a great being and a fabulous musician. Talking about people who came before. Here's another question. Here in Brazil, they've just published your uh, Zora Huston's book, Your Eyes See God, and the cover of the book, there's a phrase of yours, there's no book more important than this, Zora Neale Hurston's book. Tell the Brazilian audience about the importance of Zora Neale Hurston for the Brazilian people and the American people. Yes, oh, that's a beautiful cover. Uh, well, this is a Black woman writer who loved our culture. She loved the way we talked. She loved the way we danced. She loved the way we thought. And so this love permeated her work. But unfortunately, for a long time in the United States, how we actually were, especially in the South, was an embarrassment to you know, some people. And so she suffered from that. Uh, and toward the end of her life, she was virtually unknown, uh, you know, whereas for many years she was well known because she was a great folklorist and she traveled to many parts of the world seeking you know, African uh, connections and roots. Uh, I love that novel because she had the courage to write it the way we sound. And this was so beautiful. Um, I don't know, what else? <laughs> that's great. The book has just been published here in Brazil so for people who aren't you. familiar with it. Yeah, they will check love it. it out. They will love it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Conceição, for you, this reference for so many in Brazil, of course, without a doubt, the various different writers that we have in Brazil, but you're a great reference for the younger writers. You, Conceição, for the younger writers. And who were your influences, Conceição? Look, I will tell you about the influences outside the writing itself, not exactly writing, in search of our mother's gardens. 
our mothers. So the greatest influence without a shadow of a doubt are the stories, the oral stories, the oral text, the oral stories from my family and the older people in my family. And this accent from the oral story is an accent which affects and uh, permeates my writing and that I love to use with this oral accent. I love to use it as an aesthetic element. Mm -hmm. So the greatest inspirations for me began precisely with our mothers, the older women with their stories. And my literary background is one as every Brazilian, Brazilian writers, the references that we have, first of all, in literature or uh, authors, white authors, men and women. Only later in the social movement, I found a black author that marked me profoundly and an author, an African-American author, also African, a Portuguese African woman, but this was all in the social movement that I found them. And without a doubt, in the 1960s, I found Carolina Maria de Jesus, the only work that she published at that time, Child of the Darkness, when Alice talks about the writers from the South, when these writers write in their own language, how this caused some and bothered some people and people even some people even made fun of it as the, these authors were presenting a culture that was marked uh, markedly black culture and Carolina de Jesus, the child of the darkness, her language, it's a language which bothers some. And how Carolina de Jesus, she was so competent as a writer, it was measured by that. So not today, there are already, I say now, not today, just not the references of black writers. I think that we, and this possibility of dialogue to read Alice Walker, to read Teresa Cardenas, whom you know from Cuba, letters to my mother and the old dog to read Paulina Shijani from Mozambique, uh, Maya Angelou, how we feel at ease with these the writing, how this is writing, this is our writing, these writings, I, they empower our voice and our aesthetic and how this, we feel at ease with this writing. So for example, reading Alice's writing, when she says the phrase that helps to trigger the color purple is when her sister commenting the couple, a loving couple, and the sister says, a woman asked the other woman to get something in the drawer. So from this phrase, Alice says that clicked. And what did I remember? When I come home and my mother says a phrase uh -huh. and like that, that phrase, my mother is like the alleys of memory. So this possibility also of listening is a belief in ourselves. It's so keen in oral heritage, this performance of the body, which Alice knows so well as well. And through the American churches, the black American churches, there's a performance which you're amazed. I remember the performance by the griot from Africa because it's like preaching and with music and with dance. So it's like a griot. So all of this is extremely rich material and that we can transform into the object of it's like utensils for our literature and for defining our text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
I can, can I just say something here about the drawers? Because um, I love that story. I loved it because my grandmother, my real, you know, my step grandmother, she was a drudge, you know, she was just working, you know, kind of just no beautiful clothing, no hair, makeup, no nothing. She was just always working, always, you know. Uh, and then, then my grandfather's lover, you know, just had beautiful things and frilly things and, you know, hairdos and, you know, nice shoes and beautiful drawers. Now drawers, were not dresser drawers. They were they were panties, and they were called drawers because you draw them on, you pull them on, you know. Thus you draw, you know. So they're draw, and I just love that. And if you don't have writers who who you know, with the help of you know older sisters or whoever, to bring you up to speed on the language of your ancestors, of your you know grandparents, great grandparents. You are so ignorant. I mean, you, 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 it, it, you know, not, a, you know, I'm not saying, you know, but anyway, I mean, you don't know. I mean, you just don't know. And so that's a layer of richness in your own personality that's missing because you don't know how they created language that, that they understood and that, and it was just perfect. I mean, drawers, you know, really. So thank you for reminding me of that. It's yes. amazing in this issue and the vocabulary and semantics. We have semantics, a special semantics. I always say, and it's marked by orality. My mother, you know this, this thing in the United States, these language things. If they ask you, if you ask something about mother, mom, what do you think, for example, of the government's health policy now and so many people dying? My mother would answer like this. Huh. This, huh. She says so much. So to have this tone, the pitch, the sensibility. I think that this makes the difference in the writing. Yeah. It's like a distillation, you know, the, the language. That, that's why Zora Neale Hurston's work is so important because the language is distilled into poetry. And it's, it is almost like eating something really super nutritious and delicious. That's what that language is like. Conceição, you have a beautiful phrase when you're saying in an interview, it, it talks about what you're talking, Alice, and you, where you say that if you weep in front of a dictionary, the words are in there beautiful, but they only make gain meaning and they only touch you if you turn them into a possible experience that you've observed or even a fiction. So we're, since we're drawing near the end this issue of language it's essential in how you bring this place of writing experience and effect in your language yes and i think jamila that for us for us black women writers and regardless of writing but independently of being writers or not but i think that we impose to make people believe in our language to do that is essential to I was talking the other day with Fernanda Miranda from our team at the the board and she said that we seek this right and pursue this right to mean to signify because if there is a stereotype or if there is a aspect of denial of our humanity as blacks it was precisely the stereotype that we don't can't speak and what differentiates an animal 
from a human being according as they say is this capacity for language so when they deny our ability to speak and la have language they automatically deny our ability to think yes to produce to know to produce knowledge our capacity to for human relations so to affirm our language is to affirm our humanity and i think that literature uh, our literature involves that this affirmation of a language our language which puts us in this place as human subjects. Mm -hmm. And creators. And creators, 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 creators. And precisely writing and writers, women writers, they're creators of writing and language. They're, that may that may be difficult to accept us as writers because of that, because of due to our capacity to for creation of language mm -hmm. and how, how we create it. And don't forget, Alice was going to say something. No, and don't forget too. I'm sorry to break in, but but when we create, when we think for the larger, you know, community, let us say it's very dangerous. They really would prefer not to know what we're thinking because it's a critique. So, uh, so, uh, talvez fique difícil para eles. so it may sound difficult to them. It may be difficult for them to listen. I, I say our store is not, uh, a lullaby for the big house, but to wake up from their the cabins. unjust dreams. Wake up in the cabins. The big house will sleep, but the cabins can be awake. Entiendes? You understand that? Yeah. So, it's kind of complicated to interrupt this wonderful dialogue they're having. It's beautiful. It's flowing so freely, but I'm going to ask permission to ask some questions that are streaming in from the audience. Jamila, I would just like to say to Alice that I have, I don't know if she knows, Poncia Vivencia that's been translated uh, into English. Poncia Vivencia and two short stories, which is Maria and Hitina, which are been published. This one is published in English. And two short stories from Mexico. No, New Mexico, she says, from New Mexico, a publishing house in New Mexico, and Kitchin and Maria that have been published in Kalulu magazine. I don't oh, know what's- Kalulu. I know Kalulu. Okay. So I have two short stories in Kalulu Publishing Thank House. Thank you. So there are two short stories. I'll if you check it. it out there, you can find them. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question that came in from the audience for both writers. As black women with the mathematics of the event, we never stop sowing seeds, this need to create strategies and survive the various different lands, literally and literarily and, and in this sense, what is the best fertilizer for black art to not succumb to the Eurocentric and, and access the market? Alice, could you answer that? That was a question actually from Hisa de Souza. Well, uh, I don't know if you heard that in Texas they have over they, they have overturned the right of a woman to have an abortion. This may seem far from your question, but actually, one of the important areas for us is to control our rate of production of children. 
if we have too many and we cannot support them, uh, we can forget about creating really great art. Uh, and I think this is often overlooked, how important it is for women to control their bodies. You know, we have fought this battle uh, to control our own bodies forever. And we're back to having to fight it again in order for us to actually be able to claim any real freedom. If you don't own your body, you're still enslaved. Conceição, would you like to answer that question yourself? How, we, can you repeat the question, please? As black women and with the mathematics of the event, we never stop sowing seed, this constant need to create strategies and to survive in different lands, literally and literarily. What is the best fertilizer for black art not to succumb to the uh, Eurocentric models and not succumb and survive in the market? I think that beside all things, despite everything, not only in literature, but I think in art in general, we saw in the last three years here in Brazil, the last two years, the amount of black productions and significant black productions, which were able to survive in the market and at the same time uh, impose their work on the market. I think that these strategies for struggle of uh, making these strategies of affirmation possible, we have, a, we do this all the time. It's a constant task. I think that our journey is this. We're never going to have a place out in the sun to bask in the sun. It's constantly a time of struggle. It's a time of struggle, constant struggle. So I believe for me, in my ex personal experience, what allows me also to have art, affirmative art, of what I and affirming what I believe in, and at the same time today to perceive this art, it has survived in the market. It's always alert to the collective and attuned to the collective. To having the collective as the to sustain it, my art and literature. It was the Black Social Movement. It was my main source of sustenance and, and went the way for us to keep originality is together with our own, with our own. I think that if you leave our own, the market will swallow you and you up and spit you up. They'll offer you one thing and you lose your references or they swallow you and destroy you. So I think that it had to be together with ours. That's central. And thinking further about what Alice was saying about how we need to the issue of control of our uh, reproduction or the right to abortion, we need first to be we own our own bodies. And in the case, Alice, of the situation in Brazil, one of the things that I've asked also a lot is the following. When a woman, a middle-class woman, when a wealthy woman, or when a white woman, or when the white feminists have this discourse of the body, this discourse of the body in favor of abortion, and they can say emphatically, they can choose and say emphatically, no, I'm in favor of abortion because the it's my body. I decide how many children I want to have. I decide uh, when I'm going to get pregnant or not and when and how. I asked if poor women, when they have an abortion, when they go for an abortion, if they have the same discourse because what 
My question is the following. What leads a poor woman to have an abortion? And I'm the vast majority of the poor women are black because they have the full awareness that they have a right over their own. Is that the reason? Because they have the right over their body because they know that one more child is, she cannot uh, raise. It's going to be another source of difficulty for her. What orients this choice for the abortion? Uh, she, she knows that, does she know that she owns her own body? So I think that these discourses are important. I think that they are, they can be different. There could be different motivations behind these two different discourses. Okay, yes. May I speak as a poor woman who was a poor woman? I had an abortion when I was a student uh, and I was as poor. I had one pair of shoes and there was no way in the world that I could support anybody. I could hardly support myself. So I can speak as a poor woman, what to do as a poor woman. And I am saying emphatically, you know, to whoever is listening, you know, black women, whoever, poor women, whatever. You cannot develop to your full capacity if you do not own at least yourself. Your body is your body. Mm -hmm. And if you have, you know, tons of money and tons of time and tons of talent, even 12 children, you know, uh, and somebody to take care of every one of them, it would still be too much. So I think this is fundamental, this issue. Uh, we, we will not progress if we are bogged down with more children than we can take care of. And it's a terrible thing to do to them. Perfect. Here in Brazil, abortion is still criminalized. It's a fundamental issue here for women in Brazil. Well, it was always that way too. And we changed the law and now they're trying to change it back because they are afraid that no. there will soon be more people of color than white people. And they are deathly afraid of being outnumbered by people of color. No, yeah, and in addition to being criminalized abortion here in Brazil, where black and poor women, where do they have their abortions, the illegal abortions? They have no care or support whatsoever. I know. Brazil, hundreds of thousands of Brazilian women. So this is a great conversation, but we're moving towards the end. We've gone a little bit over. We have a lot of questions in this same sense of the gardens. Alice Walker, you talk about how your mother cared for the garden and she loved her garden. People are asking about your relationship to plants. And at what moment do you find yourself in the garden with Conceição Evadista, the questions that are streaming in here? I garden, I have always gardened. I learned from my mother. I grow incredibly good food. I have chickens. I eat my chickens eggs. I don't eat the chickens. Um, I can't imagine living without a garden, no matter how small. Um, and as I've gotten older, I don't do as much gardening by myself, but I used to do it most of it by myself. And, and I loved every minute. There's no complaint anywhere. And what about you, Conceição? How is your relationship to plants? And your, does it involve your mother? For my mother, we always planted a garden at home, even in, we had, though we had a small plot and if subsistence farming, there were fruit trees and flowers. My mother loved flowers. I have re, reading Alice Walker's writing. I saw dahlias 
I remember the dahlias from my childhood, the daisies. And I've already had vases with plants and potted plants around the house. And but with the quarantine and the lockdown, I spent a year in Minas Gerais and have a vegetable garden. So I just went out now. I came here and I'm thinking my sister wrote to me. She asked about the okra plants. The okra <laughs> plants are blooming. So I went out. Yellow and, blooms. Yeah. The okra. Okra is delicious. You just watch that grow. You plant the seed and you just watch and wait for it to grow. It'll grow and sprout at the exact time in its own time and I have chickens and ducks and I was bringing and gathering eggs into the house. And I have this relationship to the earth and what we observe here is that increasingly people lose their relationship to plants. You walk on the outskirts, you have big houses sometimes and the front is all paved over. People have lost this relationship to the earth and this contact. And thinking about part of the harvest, where are we in, in planting together and harvesting together, reaping? I think we're reaping, Alice. Aren't we reaping? We're reaping what we have sown in literature. Yes. I, to be here with you, it's like reaping. Yes, what a beautiful metaphor. That is so true. That's exactly what is happening. Hmm. And they wanted this for us. They wanted exactly this. You know, and I know we don't have time, but there's this South, this African writer, Bessie Head, who is just great. And she was, you know, her life was just so about wanting to have this for us and having none of it for herself. Just an incredibly amazing story. I want to thank Alice Walker and Kose Sang Evadista. It was a beautiful interview. In the final minutes, you can make your final comments, beginning with you, Alice Walker, for your final remarks. Unfortunately, we're drawing to a close soon. So your final remarks now, please. Well, in many ways, this is a dream come true, of course. You know, this is what, when they were out in those fields, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles you know, from another continent where the sister and the brother and, you know, everybody was also in the field or whatever they were doing for somebody else. We were dreaming, they were dreaming of this time and, and trying hard to imagine how you could actually accomplish this, that one of us or three of us could be on this coast and then, you know, five or six of us could be on another landmass somewhere they didn't even know existed. But this was the dream. This was the, they knew we had gone somewhere. Somebody, you know, had taken us. Where were we? We have to figure out a way to get back together. So I feel all of that energy, all that ancestral energy, you know, that wanted us to have just this hour together by any means necessary, you know, quoting Malcolm X, you know, by any means necessary, we get to have an hour where we look at each other, we see each other, we say, oh, you're looking great. You know, your hair is wonderful. Your skin is beautiful. You know, you look like you're eating, you know, two or three times a day, <laughs> not working so hard, don't have too many children. You know, the boss man is not raping you. I mean, it's just an incredible time. And I am very happy about it and very grateful. Thank you, Alice Walker. Kose sound, please. I also am so happy and grateful to life. Alice, we're from the same generation. I'm 75 years old, so it's beautiful to share with Jamila, who could be our daughter or even our granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So we can see that this, the, the as we sowed before, it's fulfilled in the present now, reaping and with great possibility of no being, no return. There's no turning back now. There's no turning back anymore. Now, always forward and ever, forever. And as they said the other day that we are the future that the ancestors dreamed of. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. 
that they dreamed of. Today, in the present, we've fulfilled this future. Likewise, the same way that we're dreaming for the future generations, just as everything will happen, whether they like it or not, because I'll repeat that again. The dogs bark and the caravan passes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, my sister. It was lovely. Thank you both. Thank you all. Mm. Thank you, Conceição. Thank you, Alice Walker. Mm. Here's the book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens for Bazaar. and The Water Holes by Palace Publishing House and Alice of Memory by Conceição Everisto. I want to thank Flip, Alice Walker. I'm going to take advantage of the final end of the, when I read your book, uh, the story of black women when I was 20 years old, it changed my life. Yay. So I wanted to say that to you. This literature saves our life and Conceição, this great writer who is a great reference it's always an honor to be here with i want to thank the audience that have attended until we see you again thank okay. you very much bye -bye. one and all bye bye